Welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey toward publication. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical <clears throat> Christian romance. I'm Christina Katane, and I write Christian dystopian fiction. I'm Jamie Hirschberger. I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. I'm Rhonda Hagerman, and I write fiction and nonfiction. And we really appreciate you tuning in with us today. Normally we are live, but this week are, we are pre-recorded and there's a special reason which we'll discuss in a little bit. But if you enjoy our podcast and want to support us, the, one of the greatest things you could do would be to subscribe. So down below, hit that subscribe button and you will never miss another episode because you'll get that little ding that tells you that we're going live. So <laughs> <laughs> this is the part of our podcast where we share with each other what's going on in our lives. We call it the what's up moment. So we didn't actually establish who was going to go first, so I get to choose. And since she likes to be so helpful... Jamie, help me out and you go first. Tell us what's I up knew in your you life. were gonna pick me and I, I think I always do because <laughs> I don't because I, I'm afraid the other two could be like, don't pick me first. And you're always like, whatever. <laughs> um, what's up with me personally? Well, you know, um, it's summer here and I've talked to everybody about preparing for a hurricane season for the first time ever. And okay, we're really inland. So the catastrophic stuff is not likely to happen to us, but we might be without power for a while. So I've been thinking about um, getting together, you know, kits and stuff like that. So I discovered that they make pumps that fit on the top of five gallon buckets so, so not five gallon buckets, but those big things that you could buy at the supermarket, the big round things that you normally would have to have a water cooler to use. So I got one and now I have the ability to pump water out of those big five gallon things. And I feel like it's going to be making our emergency preparedness a whole lot easier if we just have a few of those lined up in a closet somewhere, as opposed to having to keep jugs of water, because I think they recommended a gallon per person per day. And you want to be ready for, to be without power for three or four days. So anyway, I just thought that was like the coolest thing. I never knew they made such a thing. They even make electric pumps that you can charge uh, sort of like you would charge a phone or something. But in a disaster situation, you want to not have to worry about charging it. So anyway, I just thought that was the coolest thing I want to share with everybody. So that's my what's up. Have you tried it out yet? I love it. Yeah. Okay. Aww. So of course my children are drinking more water than ever because it's cool to use the new pump thing. Right. But of course they are also children. And so the 10 and 13 year olds have been pumping it directly into their mouths. Of course, I'm not letting them put their mouth in the spigot, but they stand underneath and they go, ah, 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 and they make the water go into their mouth. I'm like, really children? But I mean, I guess they're drinking more water, which is always good in a hot climate. So I can't really complain. <laughs> That's awesome. How does the 16 year old feel about it? She's irritated with the other two. That's gross. <laughs> That's nasty. I'm like, they're not putting their mouth on it. Get a glass. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, she's, she's the one who gets on our case too about, you know, bathroom humor and things like that. She's, She's like the little mother. It's so funny. I feel like our teenagers could be twins. <laughs> What's up with you, uh, Tina? Uh, well, you know, we live in the great state of Michigan, which is the entire state is a deer crossing. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so my husband hit a deer with his car. Uh, so you guys can pray for him because he's dealing with we have like our full coverage insurance and we also had gap insurance. And so he's dealing with two insurance companies trying to get all this paperwork done and they totaled the car. So he's mm. just got to jump, jump through a thousand hoops for each insurance company. Um, and so it's just, a, he's, I he's, think he's a little frustrated. Mm. His frustration level is a little high. Um, but you know, first world problems, right? Cause you know, I have a car and he's just, I'm, I'm without a ride anywhere cause he's using my car. <laughs> um, well, I don't really feel like I can complain, but. Tina, you mentioned the deer crossing. Do you guys remember that, that call that went viral from that woman who called into the talk show? Yes. And she was like, why are they putting the deer crossing here? Or, or whatever. She was like baffled uh -huh. as to why the deer crossing would be in such a populated area. <laughs> You're putting the deer in danger. <laughs> my husband oh, actually. Oh. Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> my husband actually mentioned her yesterday <laughs> and said he was starting to understand why she was so upset. 
Yeah. Let the deer crossing somewhere else. <laughs> We're going to have to find that for her, Jennifer. That woman was yeah. way too angry. When I lived in Massachusetts, um, I, when I first got my car at, right after graduation, um, you know, we did some exploring and it didn't take long before because Maine is not far from Boston. I mean, like <laughs> here, when someone says we're going to go two states away, you pack a bag, right? Not there. It's just like an hour and a half maybe away. Well, anyway, it wasn't didn't take long till we started seeing moose crossing signs. And I was just like, what? I was just, <laughs> it was out of my mind. Like, this is a crazy. And I, and then I was laughing with somebody from the area and said, um, you guys have as many of them as you do deer crossing. And she's like, deer crossing. And then she started laughing at me because they don't have deer issues there like we do. So I don't know why, but yeah. Okay. So living in Michigan, you would think that I would have seen a lot more bear crossing signs. I've seen like two or three since moving here to Florida, which really, yes. And I guess because, uh, there's more like rural. So, you know, you get outside the bubble of the villages and I'm in like the country where we're at. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe that's it because I always lived sort of in the city up in Michigan. I bet you get up to the UP and you see them all the time. You do. Yeah. All the time. Like my, well, they've moved since, but my sister-in-law and brother-in-law lived up there and they were constantly sending pictures. Oh, another bear, like in their backyard, just, you know, <laughs> around. I was like, like, oh, this is a little one. And it was pretty big. I was like, oh, okay. Watch yeah. out for your dogs. So. Well, Tina, I'm so glad Bob is okay. Like, praise God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you guys and, have alligator crossing signs? I just need to know. No, I've never. Well, no, but when you go by a body of water, there's always don't feed the alligator signs, which then, of course, you're like, well, there must be alligators. So then you look mm -hmm. around. But um, I've yet to see one except for on that nature drive that we went to. So I haven't seen an alligator in a body of water where it would be in danger of being fed. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Yet. Mm -hmm. So My favorite meme is the one. It's in Florida. And it's a street sign. And it says... Um, pedestrians, please move to the curb. And then there's like a whole <laughs> roll of alligators shows on the curb. <laughs> That's awesome. Waiting for the pedestrians. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right, Rhonda, what's, what's going up? on? What's up with you, hon? Well, um, I had to work with teenagers yesterday and I have known about this for a while and I have honestly not been looking forward to it because, um, Yesterday was the 29th anniversary of my high school graduation. And so I, it's the first time I really walked back through my high school in probably 20 years. And it's changed so much. But as soon as I, I recommend this to anybody who's feeling old, because as soon as I walked back through those halls, it was like I was 17 again. It was oh. amazing. And then my bunions started hurting from all the walking. <laughs> uh. um, so uh, anyway, um, as the curator of the museum, I, one thing I'm really passionate about is getting children involved in local history, whether it's their genealogy or not, just because if I wish that I had gotten involved much younger and I just don't think that kids, they don't think of it on their own. And so adults need to bring them into it. So I've sort of taken that on as a mission. So we created a project for these. Um, it's an um, AP class at the high school. And I didn't know how they were going to react to it but they were actually so excited. And what it boils down to is they're cutting out obituaries from old newspapers. And oh my word, it was so funny. One boy was reading one of them and he said, oh, this happened like six months before Obama was even president. And I was like, Dude, these are not even old newspapers, what are you talking about? But anyway, so it was a, it turned out to be a really fun day. I didn't know what to expect and I'm, I'm just so glad I had the opportunity. So that's what has been going on with me. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. I love teenagers. I love how knuckle, but that's just my personality. Like children's ministry. Mm -mm, nope. Mm -hmm. That's not me, but you give me a bunch of teenagers, even though mm -hmm. like the most knucklehead ones. And that just kind of, I, that speaks to me for some reason. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that you had a good experience with mm -hmm. them. That's cool. I signed up to, to teach debate to teenagers in our homeschool co-op next year. Ah, wow. I'm starting to question my sanity. <laughs> Are fun. you debating that choice? I am, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're sane now, let's check in with you next summer and see how you're right. doing. And yeah. you tell, if I told you some of the names of the kids in the co-op, Jamie, you would be like, yeah, she's going to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's up with you, Jen? 
Well, I've had a very interesting morning, which you ladies kind of know a little bit about because we were supposed to start at like a half an hour before we did. But um, this morning when I was getting my girls ready, uh, my baby girl uh, started crying that she didn't want to go to school. Now, if you know mm -hmm. my kids, my kids like school. They just enjoy it. They're, they like to learn. And and this year she um, just is really kind of come out of her shell. So she wanted to speak to me alone and we talked and she was upset because that she's, we've had a crazy year with my husband working out of state. And so we've missed school because we've gone places to see him, like try to meet part way and, or take them to the airport. I just feel like this is important for my girls to have as much time with their dad as possible. So they, you know, plus, you know, my baby girls had issues like health issues that we've just kind of figured out are probably um, asthma activity induced asthma is what they've um, well, parenting fail. I, because we had a vacation week, I did not get her inhaler into the school. I have to have a special form for both, like the teacher or by the, the doctor, which has not happened yet. And so anyway, yesterday the school called me, she'd been a recess and she needed her inhaler. Well, I didn't have her inhaler and I was out and about. My inhaler was in Otisville at my aunt's house. Cause I left my car there. So I made the decision to pick her up and take her to the inhaler. Um, she wasn't, it wasn't a life or death situation. Just, she was just in pain. And so anyway, I guess on her way out, her teacher made a comment to her about her missing so much school. And she interpreted that as that he was angry with her. Um, and she didn't want to go to school with a teacher that was angry, obviously, at her, like a, her feelings or whatever. I don't know. But um, this teacher is a, has become a friend of mine. He's taught all three of my girls. I know him personally. I know his wife personally. So part of me was like, he does not, he's not angry with you. But the other part of me is because I know him so well. I also know that he doesn't always express his emotions properly. He was kind of one of the kids, like my kids. Like he, mm -hmm. he was one of these kids, I think he's admitted this to me. Like he was advanced and he was socially awkward. And so there's still times even as an adult that like what he expresses isn't what he really means. And so anyway, um, my daughter just needed her mom to stand up for her today. So even though like it wasn't on my schedule, I went to the school and I met with the teacher and everything is fine. He felt terrible. He apologized to her. I, I knew that's mm -hmm. what was going to happen. I knew he didn't. I, I know that he loves all his students. Mm -hmm. And I know my girls have a special place in his heart because they've, we have like a, a, a friendship and a family relationship almost with, with him and his wife. So, um, but then everything snowballed, you know, like I couldn't get out of the office without like them, you know, having another conversation with me about my book. These two secretaries have read my book and they both brought them for me to sign. And I had to explain, I can't do it right now. We'll be back later. And then I had to get a hold of the, do the doctor's office and, uh, it just, it just snowballed from there. So, um, I really appreciate you ladies for being, um, just so flexible, especially when, um, I let you down, but it's kind of one of those things. And I think you girls understand that like as moms and as women, we cannot, we cannot have every plate spinning without something crashing down. And mm -hmm. if a plate's going to crash, it can't be my kids. Right. Yeah. And I just appreciate right. you girls understanding that and being flexible because now we're running a little bit behind, but um, we're here now and we're ready to do this. And I just am excited for this topic today. So yeah, it's going to be great. I'm really yeah. looking forward to uh, diving in. Yeah. So um, we uh, did pre-record this and there's a reason why. We had a conversation a couple weeks ago about our postcast and how we feel that uh, like we enjoy it for ourselves personally. Like it is our writing group. This is how we meet as a writing group. But there's also things that we, when we are critiquing each other, that it's just really some good stuff that if you're a newer writer, if you're not part of a critique group, you things that you may not think about within your own writing that you would hear if you watch us. And um, so you don't ever get to see that unless you subscribe. And it's only $2 a month. Let's be honest. It's not very much. And it, what it does is it helps us to continue to pay for this podcast and the things that we pay for in order to have um, this go out for people. So um, if you would consider supporting our ministry, we would appreciate that greatly. But you're going to get a little taste of this today. Of We took um, a section of the postcast where the ladies take a look at my back matter, the blurb for the back of my book. So it's kind of a, a double, like a double whammy. You get to see what our postcast is, but you're all, we're also going to show you a little bit about how, what goes into writing a blurb and what um, is good and what's bad. So I guess it's kind of like a free sample. We are yeah. offering you a little, a little bit of our postcast on a toothpick <laughs> as you're walking by us. <laughs> 
<laughs> in the food try type of writing. Cast. Try podcast. <laughs> <laughs> As you come up the escalator to the food court, there we stand <laughs> with a little bit, a little bit of our post gas. Um, plus, like I really appreciate this uh, clip that we're going to share because I, I know how to write a blurb. I've written them before, but this one just didn't feel good. It didn't feel. It had all the elements there but it wasn't quite right. And sometimes it just takes someone else looking at it. And you'll see as you watch this, the feedback that I got and what we ended up with, and I'm in this, this, what we ended up with is exactly what's going on in the back of my book. And I really appreciate that. So without any further ado, unless anyone has something to say, without any further ado, join us today for the topic of how to write a blurb. All right. So then that means we have Jen and we have decided not to put Jen in her isolation booth because we need to have more a discussion and um, Rhonda, uh, I don't know if you were around for this part of the. Uh, what happy about it? She we had like this. Conf yes, we have this. Well, we could we could put her in isolation just for the fun of it for like five minutes, but um, we've decided that our office uh, or our po postcast time needs to serve us because this is our writing group and it doesn't always serve us well to just submit a polished piece of writing and get a critique on it. Sometimes we need help with something and we need to bring it to our writing gale pals and why would we not do it now so that other people can also learn. So with that said, Jen, take it away and let us know what you need from us this week. Okay, so this week um, I need some help on my back cover blurb. I um, have written one before, and I I use the book by Brian Cohen called Sizzling Synopsis: How to Write a Sizzling Synopsis. And so I think I have the format the way I know I have the format the way I want it. Um, I just don't know if it is gripping enough. If uh, I'm also looking for editing, you know, as well. But it's one of those things. It's not it's not going to be the same as if I was submitting a piece of writing, which we could talk about the characters and we could talk about the way written. It. This is more just about, uh, is, is this what I should have in the back cover of my book? Cause after your cover, the next thing that is the, the most important thing for people to pick up your book is they flip it over and they read the back. So this is very, very important for me for book number two. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, I will say that I approached this very differently than I normally would because we were talking about how this particular conversation could be helpful to so many and how we may take this discussion later and edit it up and try to um, help other people go through their own blurb to perfect it, to make it better, to tweak it. And so I, I possibly spent a lot more time on it than I would have. Um, so I just wanted to start out by saying that. Right, because hopefully not only will you be able to help me, but hopefully we can turn this around and help others out there that are in the same boat or getting ready to write the back blurb for their books. So the problem that I originally came up with, and it it's not really a problem, problem is a very strong word, is that there are many recipes for writing a blurb. And I did not read how to write a sizzling synopsis. And so I'm not going to approach this the same way that you would, Jen. And so... Mm -hmm. Also, because we're, I was not coming into this with like, I'm completely happy with the format. I just want to know if it works. I went through and gave it like a big treatment and kind of to just point out the fact that there's more than one way to slice this particular pie. Right. I went through and found the template that is passed around in some writers groups for writing a blurb. And I don't know how it's the same or different than writing a sizzling synopsis. But I, but I, but I would, I would think that we could all agree upon certain things. It shouldn't be overly long. I think we could agree, right? Yep. Yep. It should clearly. Okay. So Reed Z, in fact, has a really good just guidelines. So it's not uh, a template, and it isn't do this and then do that. But Reed Z has some guidelines for making sure that your blurb is good and it's a blog post that says how to write a blurb a guide for novelists and i like it because then it's not well jen you didn't follow the sizzling formula or you didn't follow this template that i pulled up for the sake of just showing that there's different ways to handle it so reedsy says number one introduce your main characters number two set the stage for your primary conflict number three establish the stakes number four 
show the reader why this book is for them. And I think that those four hints are really good to just kind of point you in the right general direction. Okay. Would you other ladies agree? Rhonda's nodding. Yes. <laughs> I do agree. Yes. <laughs> How did you two approach Jennifer's uh, blurb? Did you have a, a format, a template, a guideline, or did you just read it and ask yourself, would I buy this book? Well, to be honest with you, I feel really bad right now because I didn't think about looking up how it should be written. I just approached it as a reader. If I pick this up off the shelf, am I interested? So to answer that question, I just read it like a reader. I think that's okay, though. I mean, because ultimately most people that pick this up, like that's my goal is a reader. Yeah. So. Yeah. So do yeah. you want me to tell you what I thought about it? <laughs> Go ahead, Dina. Yeah, go ahead. Tell her what you thought about it. Well, I I totally would read it. And I tried to tell myself that I don't know anything about this book. I just tried to read exactly what was in front of me. I didn't have any preconceived notions about what should be in there. Um, so the sentence at the top, um, perfect. I mean, you boiled that down in the way that every technical writer should boil the facts of something down. I really love that first sentence. Yes. Um, and then the, the big blurb, that's great. Um, actually, I think I know more about the story now than I already do from what we've read here in the group. Um, and yeah, I'm definitely very excited to read it just from the blurb. The elevator pitch. Um, now, is that was just separate. Need? Yeah, that was I, just like for yeah, like but, advertising and like that, like when you just need to put something small on. Yes. Yeah, okay. So this will be not what you like verbally say someone with your name at the end. Cause no, I just, yeah. that is no. literally the only thing that threw me off in the entire thing is like, here's Jennifer Carl Tong talking, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Royal, whatever. So, um, but anyway, <laughs> Awesome. I, I just I left my headphones off. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so anyway, I need to borrow this book from you or get my own copy of it because it's excellent. I don't know what I would change if you need critic critique like that. Okay. Okay. Now, when you guys say first sentence, sorry, Tina. When you guys say first sentence, do you mean the first like three, like yeah. a jilted yeah. bride, a wounded soldier? Yeah. Okay. Just on the page. Yes, that is something that is universally important. So again, every time you read somebody else's correct way to do a blurb, which let's mm -hmm. face it, Rhonda is right. The correct <laughs> way to do a blurb is the way that sells your book. Right. So, I mean, for, for me to measure it to this template or to that guideline or something is irrelevant if people buy the book at the end of the day, even though you didn't follow whatever thing. So, but anyway, um, all of the people who say how to do it would agree that that kind of a tagline or logline or whatever at the very top is essential to get right. And I think you nailed it for sure. Okay. Is that, sorry, go ahead, Tina. Okay, well, I have also read Brian Cohen's book and uh, I went back last night and reread it just to, you said it had been a long time. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty short, fast read. Um, and I think this is, uh, it follows what he recommends and it's pretty strong. There was only one thing that I found um, like for me, for me is, okay, you, you mentioned the CD speakeasy and you mentioned the great war, but I don't see anything that tells me that this is a Western. It's not, it's not. Oh, this it's is not. love in Lansing. Oh, it's in Lansing. I was thinking of your Western story. No, that's now we're near ready for this. Yeah. Okay, never mind. <laughs> so okay. that would explain why there's nothing there. <laughs> so Check. you did a good job at that, Jennifer. Right. You did a good, good job of omitting. <laughs> okay, I'm thing. done. That's all I have to say. <laughs> well, okay. So again, I feel like I am the precocious girl who's always raising her hand in class because I really took this on as an assignment and I, I really did a lot of work. So um, 
when I pulled up what I pulled up, not the sizzling synopsis, I pulled up a fiction blurb tool by Leilani Holland, which is going to be in the document that I share with you, Jennifer, so you can okay. link it. Um, she's a moderator of the Indie Cover Project on Facebook, and it's it's the it's the frame that people throw up there when somebody puts a blurb that's basically a synopsis of their story, which is not what you want. You don't want the blurb on the back of your book to read like, here's everything that happens in my story, right? Right. Hence the ideal of it being brief. And hence the ideal of in those few words that you do use, communicating the four things that Reed Z had suggested. Um, so in the simple... Um, the simple one or two sentence description, uh, Jen nailed it, okay? So then they're sort of saying, what is the one unusual or shocking takeaway from this book that would be your hook? That's Jennifer's, a best friend in the way of love is basically her shocking takeaway and she puts it right up there front and center. Loved it. Um, the main character's name is, yes, okay? Their most important goal. Now see, this is where it got tricky for me. And this is when my brain started to like play around with thoughts because <laughs> so much of this book is about John's experience and John's relationship with Will that I almost started mm. to think like he is the main character of the story. And I flipped your blurb upside down and I put John's struggle first only because it seemed a lot clearer to me that he had stakes and he had and he had a lot to lose if he were to not get what he wanted which is you know love which he thinks is love of the girl but it's really the love of god but anyway he feels like the character that has more at risk when i tried to think about what is esther risking by trusting god to remain a spinster i couldn't really come up with anything that was super compelling the way that I could with John. So I played around with this as though I was gonna flip it on its head and make John the main character. Okay. Also, in the template that they give, whatever. Again, if someone buys your book, so just put that little carrot and asterisk next to every suggestion that I give. For that, um, according to them, yours was pretty long. Uh, it went over their maximum suggested word count and I tried to whittle it down and I couldn't get it below um 180 something words by the time it was time for the podcast to start so um i i couldn't get it below 150 um that's and what then, they that's what they suggest is below 150 yeah i think so mm. see i and heard so, two to 300 see so it yeah. again you're gonna read a different this is the right way and people are strident this is the right way to write a blurb and it's ridiculous how strident people can be so I, yeah so that's a really good i'm grabbing some books out from back here excuse me um so this is the back blurb of my first book and they're almost the same exact length i would say maybe this one might have 10 or 20 more words and then when you look at the backs of these traditionally published novels i'm they're about been like mm -hmm. it's about the same so yeah, I think again it's subjective, and maybe it's also genre driven. Do you think? Because well, in romance I, you have two characters, where most novels you would have one main character, one protagonist, and what? And, I, and, I do have to correct myself. She gives you up to two hundred words. Interesting, huh? Okay. So, go ahead. The point that you made about John's really good because if you go mm -hmm. down and you read her last sentence which is supposed to be her like cliffhanger kind of thing um will john find a way to accept love from god and from esther so the the stakes the the very last sentence of her blurbs about john yeah. and if he's going to get what he's seeking yeah i really like moving john to the forefront of it because i agree i think that it he is the main character of this one as opposed to um the other two novels and or three novels in the series because um that's the whole reason why i struggled and had to go back to which is now book three and add will's perspective because i originally had written book three only from phoebe's perspective as a one perspective like kind of like jeanette oak does um but um john's story had to be told from john's perspective so i had to like make them all agree does that make sense and mm -hmm. so and then what tina just pointed out i 
um, had written that sentence over and over and over again. And I just didn't like it. didn't feel good until I turned it into, will John do this? And then I was pretty pleased with it. You don't agree, Jamie? No, I'm sorry. My kid just came in here and was wanting to oh. blast oh. whatever he's trying to say to me. So I was just oh, telling okay. him, no, sorry. <laughs> I thought well, you were like, no. <laughs> no, I don't agree with you, John. Okay. Well, let me just read for you. I'll just read it to you. And this, mm -hmm. um, this came out to... Um, because then I start chopping at words. I got it down to 181, okay? And here okay. it is with John first. A wounded soldier, a jilted bride, a best friend that stands in the way of their love. Beautiful, okay, so now here we go. Life ruined John Ward for any woman long before the great war ruined him physically, but he might be willing to make an exception for the pretty blonde from the CD speakeasy. However, when he discovers that the beauty is the longtime love of his best friend, he resigns himself to avoiding her at all costs. Twice jilted Esther Albright is determined to trust God with her future, even if that future leaves her a spinster. But when a brooding news reporter comes to town, his hazel eyes and arrogant smirk test Esther's resolve to remain single. Avoiding love isn't easy. Mutual attraction and fate keep drawing John and Esther together until tragedy brings home the one person that could keep them apart. Will John find a way to accept love from God and from Esther, or will mistaken identity and loyalty to a friend make him walk away from both? I love it. It's basically yeah. taking what I did and making it better and more compelling. Well, and the and I think that the the secret is trying to pick out where you could whittle mm -hmm. whittle it down and still maintain. Because I mean, really, is it important that everybody knows that she's the pastor's daughter? Well, Reverend Albright is important, but that's not really a pivotal uh crux of your plot that she's right. a after solder and and um and so anyway i just really tried to make it a can of condensed soup and um and then the the okay and so then the biggest piece of me which i bet is something you're gonna say but this has to be there i do not like a historical christian romance from jennifer carl tong because i want to read about the book and so maybe that's arguable do you guys like having it there I would prefer to be at the bottom. I'm just copying genre. I went on to Amazon before before um, publishing this one, and a ton of them do that. And then, but it's also not on the back of the book that way. This this is oh. this is how it's in Amazon. So to get those nugget words that you need for searchability in Amazon, that's why that's there. But it will not be on the back of the book. I guess I should have. I guess I really wasn't thinking about pointing that out to you. But that's just me following genre um, expectations or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah but it, that won't be on the back of the book. Agreed. Well, and if it's uh, and I won't know, say buy buy this novel on the back of the novel because so you know what I mean. It, that's only for Amazon. So, so all right. Uh, yeah. So I love all that, that you said. I love that you wrote it down. I think this is why this is so important. I think that we share this in the podcast, not just the postcast, because writing a blurb is hard, not just because we can't write or that words are hard because we can clearly do that, but it's because we are so invested in our stories. It's hard for us to step outside of our story and decide what's important and what's not. What is the, the main crux of everything? Like, you're right. It isn't important that she's a pastor's daughter, but I took so much else out that I thought that that was important. But once you read yours, I'm like, no, that's really what the story is. And so it's good to have someone else look at it, but it's also, it's, you, you've got to be able to step away from your story. I know you love your story. I know you love every part of it. And you think everything is important, but it's not. Everything is not important. You just got to tell us what is going to be the compelling parts. What is the main important information that will draw me to want to read that story. And the fact that she's a pastor's daughter is not one of those Save things. Save that for the book. Yes. And, and that, go ahead. And I was just going to say too, like when you read this um, and I'll, we'll put it up there where people can read it too. When you read this, um, the information on the back of here really is only the most of it is really only the first 25, maybe 30% of the book. I do hint at the tragedy that's coming later. Um, so that's farther into the book. But I don't tell you, like you said, I don't tell everything that happens. I just tell you like the, the ramping up and then you got to read the book to get the rest of it. So. Yeah. And um, so I think that, you know, we're talking about word count limits or whatever. And I think that a really strict something like 200 word count limit will really help you to decide if you are giving your reader too much and and not because okay 
uh, just like when you're editing your book, you have to have a different hat on than when you're writing your book. When it comes time to market your book, which this really is marketing your book, yes. you have to have a whole different hat on because this is ad copy. This is not convince everybody that I'm a terrific writer and I deserve a Pulitzer. This is selling your book to people. And if you think about it like that, there's a reason that commercials are only 60 to 90 seconds long. You have just a split second amount of time to captivate someone and to get them to click buy now. And if, you, if you're giving yourself a uh, carte blanche to take as many words as you need, you run the risk of synopsising <laughs> what you really should be ad copying, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So whether that limit is 250 or 200 or whatever it's supposed to be, the, I think the purpose of giving someone a word count is to let them know it needs to be short and only say what it needs to say to sell the book, like Jen said. Right. You know what the best time to write your blurb would be is when you first get your idea for your story. Because oh. in, in traditional publishing, I've heard this more than once in interviews, in traditional publishing, the people that write the blurbs for the back of the books do not read the book. They don't read the book. They just get the information they need and then they throw that, they just get the bare bones and then they write something. And that's how it works. And we have finished reading the book. We are so invested in this book. And then it's hard for us to separate ourselves out to just get the bare bones. So I, that's what I need to do. I need to start writing my blurb the minute I start the story, like the minute I have the idea and know where it's going. I think that's a really good piece of advice, Jennifer. I think that a lot of people could really really do well to try it, to try that technique. So sorry, mm -hmm. Rhonda, it seemed like you were trying to chime in there. No, I was just going to point out a while ago how much uh, Jennifer likes Drabbles. So this should be super easy for her. And <laughs> second of all, um, that is a fantastic piece of advice to write this, the, the back portion before you even start writing the story. I'm going to do that today. Because you, cause you can always edit it. Right. Mm -hmm. You can always make right. it better, but it's so much easier to edit it and add to it than it is a takeaway. Yeah. I really yeah. need to polish my audio editing skills so that I could uh, take Rhonda saying that's a pa fantastic piece of advice and just push that button. <laughs> and every time I say something, Rhonda's voice could chime in. <laughs> that I is can... a fantastic piece <laughs> of advice. <laughs> I can do that for you. We should have it as ringtones every time she calls us. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with absolutely everything you said. I'm going to do that today, right when I get home. So, um, Jennifer, uh, do you think this has been helpful? Should we talk more about this? What do you no, think? No, very mean? helpful. Like, I love what you did. I'm going to take a look at that and fix that. And I think it's ready to go. I'm ready to put it on the back of the cover. Like, that was very, very helpful. Thank you. I loved that life ru ru ruined him for women before the war ruined his body. Like, that's just amazing. Me, what a great. Me too. That was one of my favorite lines. Why didn't I start with that? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, as you're reading it, I'm like, duh, that was my favorite line in the whole thing. Why would I not start with it? And it, in my opinion, sucks you in like, oh, he's wounded. And yeah, because mm -hmm. it is important to know that. Like that, that plays a lot. I mean, at the beginning and it plays a lot into like, you know, his interaction. I mean, it's, it's an important, that's an important part. The fact that she's a pastor's daughter. No, the fact that he's injured in the war. Yes, that, mm -hmm. that does. So and because that's this major obstacle to what he wants. Yeah. And it's a, a physical kind of embodiment of also his internal injuries too. So yes. And his insecurities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so thematic that it's, it's the whole theme of the piece is wrapped up in the fact that he's broken mm -hmm. physically and spiritually. Right. And yes. so it's brokenness is communicated right there in the beginning. And then you bring it home at the end by saying like, can he find God and, you know, and be with the woman that he loves. So it's great. You don't even really talk about the mistaken identity piece either, but you don't need to know that. Like, I mean, you don't really say the words that he thought it was the wrong girl or kind of whatever. Do right. you know what I mean? Right. I, but I just mention it at the very end and then you're yeah. like, mistaken identity. like just, I, cause I feel like you, I had to mention it because it's such a huge part of the book. I mean, like when you read it, people read it, they're going to see that. But um, yeah, I don't want to tell people. You don't want to tell people. You want to draw them into like the characters. Like we talked about this with, with Tina last, was it last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks when ago. She, when she shared her blurb, it's, you've got a story, but it's the people. It's the characters that you're writing about for your blurb. And that's important. And you did that today, Jamie. I appreciate it. And so, I well, like yeah. totally whittled that down, by the way. I should probably, maybe I should uh, submit it for next week and show yeah. you the yeah. that I made. 
Yeah, yeah that would be, be really fun. Yeah. Okay. So Jen, anything else you need out of, out no, of that from us? That was great. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Welcome back to present day, which I guess is recorded as well. So <laughs> um, I, I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed that happening for, uh, for my book. So when you, when you ladies watch it, does it help you to watch, rewatch re things that we have talked about? Do you guys ever go back and rewatch any of our episodes? I do. Why yeah. do you? Like why? What, what what do you get out of it, Rhonda? You're the first one to answer. Um, I need to rewatch things and I do this to movies too, so I don't maybe we're movie stars, but um I need to rewatch things to make sure that I um get everything that was said because someone will say something and that'll spin my mind off into another direction and and I might miss something that's being said, so I always try to rewatch it once or twice. Well, I think uh, it's really cool to see that. And I just want to mention to people that if you do subscribe to our postcast, it's kind of um, undergone a little bit of growth, I guess, from the very beginning. We used to only do a certain format, uh, and and now we kind of are, are mixing things up a little bit. So I think that you'll see um, things changing, and um, we're really coming into our personality. So I think it'd be a fun thing to go back into those archives and start with that very first episode mm -hmm. and see I, I the know, postcast. I don't know if I would call it fun, because if you go back and watch our podcast, the first couple episodes, it's almost painful. <laughs> Which is I watched sad. our first one recently. It was Yeah. And that's our number one podcast. People still go back and watch our first one, which is called Writing Groups. And uh, it's our by far our number one podcast. And I watch it and cringe. I'm like, ooh, we've mm -hmm. gotten a little bit better than that. <laughs> but I do think you're right. Like, I think that like going back and watching the different things is, is helpful for us as well. So I hope that like others find it helpful. Well, and I think that Tina, um, you're gonna change the settings and, and give a whole postcast for free on our Patreon, right? Yep, I was just gonna say that for a special treat. Um, there's a, there's a, another postcast that was actually earlier than the little clip that we just watched where I submitted my blurb. So if you're interested in seeing another critique of a different kind of blurb, um, and mine probably wasn't as polished as Jennifer's was to begin with. So you can see some of the feedback for that. So we're going to offer that entire episode, though, for free. So you can see what the, an entire postcast episode would look like. And, and you can decide if you want to spend your $2. So that's like getting four toothpicks full of chicken yeah. instead of one. That's like a little dish. <laughs> you know, with one of those little spork things that are it's like a Sam's Club, big. a Sam's Club sample instead yeah, of that's a, it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. When um when you when you watch these two, you will see similarities between mine and Tina's because we both have read the book by Brian Cohen, which I will uh, link down below in the description of this video. Um, how to write a sizzling synopsis. Also, when you watch Jamie's uh, critique of mine, she also used a couple other, um, at least one other resource that we will also link down below for if you are starting to write this. And I do believe what I said um, in that clip that you're watching is I think that the best time to write your blurb is right when you get the first idea, or at least when you have the outline. Because as you write the story, you get so invested that everything feels important to you and everything isn't important enough to make it to the back of the book. Really, you only want to put what is tasty, you know, and then you don't want to give away too much. Like, for example, for what we just we just watched, um, I only give you like what's happening like in the first twenty five percent of the book because that's enough to pull you in, and I don't want you to know any more than that. So, and I might actually um, put a link to my revised blurb. Oh, good idea. on there, like what I changed after you guys gave me your feedback, so then they mm. can see the before and after. You know what? That that, would be fun. That's that's a great idea. And I need to do a cover reveal very soon. So maybe <laughs> I will do first do my blurb reveal um, before this goes live so that I can do the same thing and have a link to like maybe. Yeah, because that would Facebook. really be helpful for someone to see the before, yeah. hear the, the critique and then see what we did to change it. Yeah, that's a great idea. 
So, and if you're watching this and you have any suggestions, things that you would like to see us do, um, like, like something like that, please comment below or like I said, I've always say reach out to us on uh, social media. Twitter is probably the fastest way to get a hold of us because we kind of use our Twitter accounts really to connect with other writers. Instagram, I kind of connect with writers, but it's mostly for people that are fans of um, Christian romance. Um, Facebook, we're not so good with Facebook. We probably should maybe invest a little bit more time there. But yeah, so reach out to us on social media. Give us some suggestions that, that of... Um, of what you would like to see or what that you really feel like you need because that's what we're here for we we can't do everything right but we would like to be able to help you if there is something that you are struggling with as a christian writer that you think we might be able to help with we would love to be able to help with that because we didn't have that resource when we first started out the four of us before we met we were kind of out there floating on islands all by ourselves and uh, we want to be i guess the ship that unites all the islands I hadn't really thought about that analogy to begin with. That's going to be a famous quote one day. Yes. Best-selling gonna... author, Jennifer Tong. Yes. Quote. I'm the tugboat of this. <laughs> I don't even know. I'm just making it worse. I need to stop right now. Does that so. make me the dinghy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know what that makes you and me, Rhonda, but I think we should just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, if we don't have nothing else to say about that, it is time for us to go on to the feeding of the bags. Before Yay. every episode, yeah, before every episode begins, we spend time writing a quick write that we use either five quick words or we do some sort of other writing prompt and we set a timer for 15 minutes. Normally we're live, so we will an hour or so before we go live, we will add our quick write uh, words or whatever the topic is to our Twitter account so that people can write along with us. This week, since we're not live, we're, we're not able to do that, but today we still did it. So we did our five words and uh, Tina, why don't you share those five words with us? Okay, let me just open my document real quick. That Those words would be Europe, hostel, innocent, register and company. Yeah, and it's so funny because if you put the word hostel after Europe, suddenly you're thinking about a hotel that is cheap instead of like aggression against another person. So we're like, hostel? What kind of hostel? Tina's like, H-O-S-T-I-L-E. Oh, okay, good. That's what I used. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so funny. We don't have hostels here in America. Well, we have hostel. Yeah. <laughs> but not hostel. <laughs> For Sash sure. stayed in a hostel when he was uh, traveling through Canada. That was a neat oh. experience. Hmm. Well, we All can right. Talk, I will talk on that a little bit more once I read mine. But I'm not going first today because I'm in control. And Jamie <laughs> always thinks you go first. And because of that, I am making Jamie go first. Oh, fine. All right. Where is it? Here it is. All right. I'm bummed because I won't be able to see your faces while I read this. I'll have to tune in later. I'm not that innocent she said, stealing a cheddar fry from the bag between us. If you quote one more Britney Spears lyric today, it's over. I jam my finger in her direction. What's over? This road trip? Good, because I didn't even want to come with you to Boise. No, not the road trip, our friendship. Oh, come on. You know you love it when I quote song lyrics to you. I like it when you pepper your conversation with them, not when you make it your personal mission to use as many as you can in the space of 45 minutes. Is that how long it's been since we last stopped? Have you been keeping track? How many have I managed? I've picked up on lyrics from Europe and Bad Company, though. I'm sure there were other little comments you've made that just didn't register as song lyrics at the time. She turned her body so her back was toward the passenger side window. I stole glances at her as I reached for more cheddar fries. I can't believe you would end our friendship over something so ridiculous, she said. After all, no matter how hostile you become, I'm never ever going to give you up. I threw, <laughs> I threw the cheddar fries at her. She screamed in mock agony and pressed a hand to her eye, though the cheddar fries had bounced impotently off her arm. Through stolen glances, I watched as she doused a napkin with water from her bottle and dabbed at the feigned injury. Ah, she said, I can see clearly now. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah, ah. 
<laughs> I'm going to kill you, I mutter, silently surrendering to my fate of being stuck next to the human lyric machine. I tell myself I should be thankful that she is at least not singing the song she is quoting. As if reading, reading my mind, she turns toward the cars in the lane next to us and beats on the window. Help, she screams, sing. I need somebody. <laughs> That does it, I say, and put on my blinker. I zip into a space just big enough for my Fiat and accelerate toward the next exit ramp. Jen, I was kidding, she says. <laughs> Her eyes grow wide. I catch a green light at the top of the ramp and hang a right and pull into the gas station on the corner. As I slide into a parking space and jam the car into park, I point at her door. And then time was up. But I was oh. going to never say something like hit the road, Jack, or whatever. Oh, that would be great. Okay. I'm, I'm so there, disappointed that you didn't get Help Me Rhonda in there. Oh, yeah. Is there anything that inspired you to do this today? The word innocent. It was immediately that Britney Spears song came into my head. I just could not do that lyric. You know, it's so funny that like, as you're reading, I'm like, she is so not the narrator in this. Like, Jamie, if anyone else that's watching this, Jamie is the other character, but she's inside the narrator's head. And then when you got to the name of the narrator, it was me. I was like, that, this is so classic. This is so classic. This is me and Jamie in a car. And Jamie, and then when you said, I, I should be thankful that she's not singing. And I'm like, oh, it's not Jamie then, because she totally was singing it. And then she started singing. And I'm like, that's totally Jamie. <laughs> That was awesome. So I'm great. so glad you liked it. That was so oh, funny. That's nice. probably my favorite ever from you because it's so you. That's awesome. All right. Who wants to follow that? <laughs> I will. Well, I might as well go. Okay, good. Okay. I kind of um, am stuck with another character I wrote the other day, although she works for a different company now. So it's. Oh, she's, uh, she the works for the police, or... the secretary. Oh, yeah. I don't think our listeners or watchers or whatever got to read that piece. I hope someday you'll polish no, that, it. I think that was like our personal one that we were doing. Mm. Okay. Okay. The Europe Division is reporting losses that are worrisome, said Mr. Smith. The boardroom was too hot and the day too gray. Priscilla wiggled in the cushioned black office chair in a vain attempt to stay awake. As Mr. Mr. Smith's voice droned on, Priscilla drifted into a dream. It was full of green fields of flowers and a crystal clear creek that ran through her grandmother's property. Priscilla had spent the summers there in the innocent years of her childhood. It was the place she returned to in her mind again and again when life got too difficult or dreary. Today was definitely one of the dreary days. Rain had been falling in sheets for days, smearing out the London's, London skyline, and the damp cold seemed to have settled into Priscilla's bones. Perhaps she should ask the company for a transfer to some place without a hostile climate. The Virgin Islands promised warm sunshine year round, mm -hmm. but they were also susceptible to hurricanes. Maybe the south of France. Did they have a division in the south of France? Just then Grandma appeared on the porch and called her name. Priscilla, Priscilla, do you hear me? <laughs> Priscilla's eyes popped open to find Mr. Smith's face directly in front of her. Are you all right? You're pale as a sheet, and we have the hardest time waking you. I'm not sure. I think you need to go home and rest, said Mr. Smith, or perhaps hop on a plane to the south of France. It took several moments for what he'd said to register, and just as Priscilla opened her mouth to reply, the fire alarm began to blare. Everyone in the room ran for the exits. Priscilla tried to get out of the chair, but her body wouldn't respond. She clamped her hands over her ears to block out the alarm to no avail. She tried again to stand up. Nothing. What was she going to do? She pushed back on the table with all the strength she could muster. The chair flew backwards out through the window, and then she was falling. That is so good. I hate then, dreams like that, where you can't get yourself to move. Oh, that was the uh, worst. The timer, um, the timer went off before I could have her wake up with the alarm blaring. Yeah. Yeah, but I think you did a really good job. Like I think mm -hmm. didn't you guys also catch that? Like without yeah. you saying that it's the alarm, like we totally understood mm -hmm. now we're, like the whole time we didn't understand it, but then there was a certain point where, oh, this is a dream, and then we're able mm -hmm. to follow through. So yeah, I that was great. When right. our readers don't get the joy of knowing that either this is like a premonition dream or this is a 
memory of actual events dream because in the other scene she had to get out of the building because mm -hmm. of whatever was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of making me want you to write this book. So that's mm -hmm. not a good thing because I'm going to be <laughs> on your case about it. <laughs> I'll have to put it on a list. Yeah. Right. Well, if she continues doing this character with these exercises and, you know, by the time she's done with this book that she's working oh, on now. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plenty of fodder. No. Yeah. My whole Whittles of the West is starting off from different exercises that we did last summer. So yeah, I can really do that. So mm -hmm. awesome. Good job, Tina. Good job, Tina. Thanks, Who's next? Jamie? I already went. Rhonda, oh, do you want to go last Rhonda. or do you want to go next? I'll go last. I didn't hear what she said. What did you say? I'll go last. I'll okay. go last. <laughs> it just did like cut out. And so I'm like, I don't know if she, so I was about to say, okay, go ahead. And then that would have been so rude. If it, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's called a hostel for a reason. Todd said, taking a swig of his overpriced bottled water. It's a different <laughs> smelling, I argued. Both Todd and Cindy stared at me. Their annoyance was clear. Our time in Europe had been quite the adventure, but nothing had compared with the catastrophe we had experienced last night. We should have known it wasn't going to go well when we registered to stay the night in the small Italian pensione. But the quaint furnishings and delicious smells that wafted from somewhere in the back of the bed and breakfast seemed innocent enough, and we were all too exhausted to admit that the company we were would be keeping for the evening was a little suspect. I know that smarty pants, Todd spat at me. I was making a pun. Sorry, I said, feeling a little ashamed for having corrected my friend. Come on, guys, we're all a little tired. Let's not make, let's not take it out on each other, Cindy said. Yeah, I think we've experienced quite enough hostility for one trip. I smiled sheepishly at Todd. He continued to frown. My joke was better. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> this finally brought a smile. I handed him a focaccia bread sandwich, which he took gratefully. We hadn't eaten since breakfast yesterday, having missed dinner last night due to the raid by the Polizia di Firenze. It's strange how all of that great Italian ospedali ospitalita, it's been a long time, sorry, or hospitality, as we say in the States, flew out the window once we became their hostages. Wow. Three, mm. two, one. I like how you got both hostels in there. Thank I you. I don't like your use of focaccia bread because now nothing is going to satisfy me the way a focaccia <laughs> bread sandwich would yes. satisfy me right now. Okay, so you have to go to Italy and actually have a focaccia sandwich there. I think I better not. Nothing, <laughs> yeah, because then nothing here will ever satisfy. Like I can't even eat focaccia here because it's just not good compared to there. Like we are so. Um, obviously, I've been to Italy before. I guess I shouldn't say obviously, but I have a couple times. Um, but when I was in college. Friends of mine, my friend Cindy, who lives in Hawaii or who's from Hawaii, um, her mom said, come here, we'll stay for free and spend your spring breaks. We're like, yeah, plane tickets just to go. We couldn't afford. It was just too expensive just for the plane tickets. And then um, Alitalia Airlines came out with a um, an, an ad where they it was like four hundred dollars to fly round trip to Italy. Wow. Yeah. And we had it was in the fall like that came out in the fall and we had plenty of time to um save up like for the rest of the trip so that's what we did because we all have a, have been taking italian and um so it was a lot of fun it was very exhausting and by the end we were on each other's nerves we did not we were not hostages this is not a true story <laughs> by any means but uh -huh. um i have a lot of great great memories from that trip and so um as soon as i saw the word europe and hostel and like the, uh, that's all it came to mind was like i had to write about something about italy so and was your story um, in Florence? It was. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess have, I didn't clarify that. I did say it in the French or the Italian mm -hmm. version of it. Yeah, I have a t-shirt from my trip to Italy. I should send mm -hmm. you a picture. Hey. And it says Firenze right across. Yeah. Wouldn't that be Ooh. funny if one of you was in the background of the other person's photo? Oh, that would crazy. be amazing. I, mean, <gasps> I know, I, well, right? I was well, only, you write that. That's from my story. I was only 13 when I went, so. Oh. I don't well, think that. no, yeah, I'm older than you. Yeah, that wouldn't have worked. I was 21 yeah. when I went. So the second time, yeah, I went I in high school. I think I'm about three years older than you. So, yeah. 
So but, I've been to Florence. I've been to Florence, um, Kentucky. And oh, every time we drive past, we see the big uh, water tower. Uh, like, Florence, hey, Florence y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there too. We actually had a, a sister youth group right there that we would go visit frequently. Yeah, Florence, y'all. Yeah. If you ever get a chance to go to Europe and you can only go to one town, because there's so many great places in Europe, obviously, I would pick Florence. It's that great of a city. No, no. The history. Have you been there? No, no, but, but I've been to Edinburgh, Europe, and that is the one to go to. What What is? Edinburgh. Oh, okay. I haven't been to Scotland, so I guess I can't compare. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> one is no comparison. Time, but the, one, yeah. the one thing I had in Europe that I can't even drink anymore is the hot chocolate. Because mm. the hot chocolate in Europe is like they took a Hershey bar, put it in the cup, <laughs> and melted it. Like, it's so rich and thick and good. Wow. and. I can't even drink her hot chocolate here now. I'm just ruined. Mm. Yeah, the food. All right, I'm getting hungry. Let's move on. Rhonda, you're last. <laughs> your turn. Yeah, uh, mine's very short. Um, I did get all the words in, but I'm going to call it uh, Drabble, not Drabble. Um, I was, I've been in this mindset of finishing my Beatles story. And so I just, I never really figured out what my character's background was. So I figured it out. And when it was done, it was done. So, all right, here it is. I spent several years in Europe as a child where I was told my father worked for a company who made those little brass wheels that open and close the heat register. It turns out his job was much more interesting than that, if you can imagine. While I was strolling down Abbey Lane, skipping through the park with daisies in my hair like an innocent, he was fighting off hostile forces in secret war rooms. I got involved with the Beatles, British Espionage and Train Lethal Envoy Service, before I knew anything about my father's spying activities. I guess this was a case of nature versus nurture. The end. Yay. Oh it's all about awesome. my character. <laughs> I love that. That's I the first time I heard the acronym for Beatles. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, now you know it's not a secret anymore. Yeah. I feel like it's really a good demonstration of how you can use writing sprints to just really help you with whatever project you're currently working on. I mean, yep. I think that the tendency is to believe, well, I'm wasting time that I could be spending doing blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. frankly, Sometimes you could get a little bit stale or stiff if you don't break out. And here is a way to break out but still feel like it's safe because it is helping you to make progress in your mm -hmm. current your current piece. And, and so even if you write something totally different off the wall, you're still mm -hmm. exercising that muscle, mm -hmm. that creative muscle in your mind. So it's not a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Good job. I really enjoyed that. All right. It is time for us to move on to our accountability corner where we check in with each other to see how we met our goals from last week and then to set new goals for the coming week. Um, and because we are recording, we are actually ending our week a little early. So we may not have met our goals yet. So we're going to talk about kind of in the future. Are we going to be able to make our goals that we set for last week? And what do we need to do to accomplish that? And as well as set our goals for the coming week. Can I say goals or week any more times in this? <laughs> I bet you can. I don't know, but it's a. I have a week goal, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh. My joke. Uh, all right, that was very punny. So you get to go yeah. first. <laughs> um, I haven't made no progress toward my goal. Oh. Did you say well, I haven't made no? I have made no okay. progress. Um. I did make it to office hours yesterday for the first. 15 minute sprints, um, but I had a co op registration um, and then I was just tired. So I didn't do any writing yesterday other than that sprint. Um, and oh, everyone's been sick here. So the, our, my weekend was pretty shot. So uh, better day tomorrow. So do you think you'll be able to meet your goal by the real deadline, which is a couple days from now? Like if you buckle down? Um, well, my goal was to show up to office hours every day and do something towards editing my book. So, so no, uh, <laughs> no. Um, but I'm, I'm going to continue. I'm going to get back on the wagon. Awesome. For lack of a better term. Well, wait a minute though. You did show up for office hours yesterday. You just couldn't stay. So yeah, I just did the 15 minute sprint. All right. So but I didn't think work on any editing. Mm. Oh, okay. So that was part of your goal was every day do some editing. Gotcha. Yeah. Yep. All right. But don't throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. So right. you start over today. My brain's still glowing. Yeah, there you go. So. Just lose your face. 
What a really disturbing it. expression. Like who would not see the baby or not know? <laughs> you know the you in know the bathwater. All right. Do you know how that? What I thought it was you that told us how what that where that originated. Do you know you can go that, ahead and say it. It's I, so gross. Know, like for me to say yes, I know, and shut you down would not be cool. So go ahead and tell everybody. <laughs> so back in the day, they would have once a week or how when at once a month, I don't know, they would do a bath and they'd do the hot water. And the first one that got to go was the dad. And then it went down from there. And the last one that got to go was the baby. Cause it was kind of like an order. So the, by that point, the water would have been dirty. Right. And so you don't want to lose the baby in the bath when you throw it out, you know, so that's, it's just, it makes me nauseous every time. Like <laughs> that doesn't sport. make any sense. The baby should go first uh, and the no. dad last because the dad's the dirtiest. Right. I know. But, you know, dad brings home the bacon so he gets the hot water. I don't know. Like, I, whatever happened to women and children first? Man. Well, I think who I would think that dad wouldn't get very clean. And I think it was more important for dad to be showing up respectable looking possibly. Everybody expects a dirty kid. But you, you know, that's I'm thinking that's what the logic is. And also it's sort of like a privilege, just like, you know getting the best cut of meat or kind of whatever would be in those old sort of patriarchal systems. In my family, the baby would have been in the tub with the dad. Like, <laughs> all right, I have other things to do. Here you go. <laughs> like how many of you have ever like walked into your husband, like taking a shower and handed the kid over. He needs a bath too. And then walked away and did dishes or something else. Like yep. that's, we've done that. So I guess the, I can't remember my mind around it. Now, just because that's the, the lore or that that's what doesn't mean that every family did it that way. So I'm hoping <laughs> that there are a lot of moms and dads out there that did it the way I just said. So whatever. All right, squirrel. Uh, who, <laughs> who wants to go next? Well, I will since I sent us off on the tangent. Um, I, I don't know if I will meet my goal by Thursday because I was really planning to have my rough draft of our Christmas story finished. And uh, wow. it's not looking really good. Mm. You know, the forecast is not good. However, if I'm writing every day and I'm paying attention to that being what my goal is, it's possible. So I'm not going to amend or tweak or cancel or change the goal. I'm just really wondering, will I make the goal? And also, mm -hmm. I did show up for office hours every day, except for like yesterday. So after Tina went off, uh, John Rhonda wasn't due to come in for a little while. I'm like, are you really coming? Because if you're not, I'll just go back mm -hmm. to bed. And she was like, ha, 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 well, go to bed if you want. And so I did. <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you that I was like – some seconds away from my driveway when you text me, but you sounded so pitiful. I was like, there's no way I'm going to stay in there. <laughs> so I did show up, but I did not, I did not do, you know, a full day's worth of office hours. So that is a confession. But so my going forward goals is to, yes, get that. If I don't have the first draft done by this deadline, I'll have it done for the, for the next deadline for sure. So it will be an ongoing goal. All right. What about you, Rhonda? Well, um, let's see, my museum goals for the week were met very well. I was really pleased with that. Um, my goals that I made last week for the Beatles story, um, well, I'll find out if my one beta reader is going to tell me I should move on with it or not, so we'll find out. But I would like to think that I will be able to get that submitted today or at the very latest tomorrow. And my um, book cover for my... Um, nonfiction piece, uh, that one is, um, that's done. And getting it all into KDP for the final time and not tweaking anymore, hopefully will be done by Thursday. So hopefully by our next accountability time, I'll be able to tell you that, yes, I did succeed by Thursday. Awesome. Jamie, did we get your goals for next week or did I cut you off? Well, it's kind of like a, a overflow goal. If I don't get my goal done by Thursday because I'm going to have a little bit of traveling going on, then that will be the goal. So it's sort of like an extension. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Can I ask you, uh, Jamie, you were talking about having your rough draft done. Does that leave enough room for any changes you might want to make on Monday if uh, you see something that inspires you? or? Oh, um, sure. That yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because it would be technically Thursday. That would be the next goal, right? Mm -hmm. And we all have the deadline of the 15th. Well, yeah. I was specifically asking about you having your rough draft done. 
uh, if there would be enough wiggle room, if you found something on Monday that you thought this has got to go on my story or this is not going to work in my story, is that going to mess you up at all to already have your rough draft done? Nope. No, I don't think that it will because um, if it's that, if it's that impactful to me, I will, mm -hmm. I will know exactly how it fits and how it works and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Because otherwise, like it won't, it won't even cross my mind to change anything. Mm -hmm. Like if, if I'm done, if I'm done by Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let me quickly do my accountability so we can talk about Monday and let uh, everyone know what we're talking about when we say Monday. So okay. um, I will, I do believe I will meet my goal of being caught up with Jamie on the editing because Jamie is my editor and um, Jamie has finished. She Yay! has edited the whole book and I am um, six chapters away from having finished fixing issues and having the the um draft ready for final copy proof editing once i'm uh, formatting it and then getting a, a copy to hand to a copy editor so um i believe i can do that um i did not show for office hours every day because my um aunt who i helped take care of had a doctor's appointment yesterday that i somehow had missed in communication and she um i don't believe i have any doctor's appointments with her the next coming week um, um so my goal moving forward is by the next, which I guess is next Monday, which we'll talk about, is to have um, all the, the edits will be done uh, from my end, fixing the problems by Thursday, as I had planned. And then by the time that we get together again, I plan to have it formatted into um, vellum and have it ready to be able to send off to get a hard copy of an advanced copy for to hand off to the copy editor that's my goal and i believe i can do that yay so we keep talking now i was thinking it was tuesday i'm so glad you brought it up i had it written down for tuesday so monday of next week next week we will not be live on thursday as usual but our plan is to be live on monday and why is that jamie well, because I will be in Michigan and Yay! I'll be able to see all my friends. <laughs> and I, so we're hoping that we can live stream from somewhere super fun. Yes, there's, we um, are looking at, um, I've, I've scouted out in our, our fictional town for our Christmas compilation that we are doing um, is based on a real live town here in Michigan called Lapeer, um, loosely based on it. And so for inspiration, I and my baby girl went to Lapeer a uh, um, couple weekends ago and um, went to a sandwich shop and dessert shop, coffee shop that um, I had been to before that I enjoyed. And it's like even better now. And the owner there was so gracious and said, yes, you can do the podcast from here live. So we're going to see how that works out. It could be a complete disaster. But it could be awesome too. So um, rather either way, it'll be a great episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be worth your money that you don't pay. Um, so instead of tuning in on Thursday, you'll be able to join us on Monday of next week, which would be Monday, June thirteenth. Is it tenth? Tenth. Wow, I was off. Mm -hmm. Monday, June tenth, we will be live, same time, ten o'clock, um, broadcasting from Dagwoods and. Um, Blondies. And Blondies, thank you. So if by chance you're in the area and you want to be around while we podcast, show up there by 10 o'clock and we will be there in the little cafe <laughs> during that. That would actually be fun to have an audience, which one last thing I want to share that is no longer a secret that I can share now. Uh, we will have one audience member there. Um, my husband, Randy, is coming home. Yay! Oh, yay! So a uh, job opened up. It is supposed to be temporary only for the summer, but we'll take it because the, the company my husband works for in Nebraska is not, is very sad that he's leaving. But they said if that job does not go past the summer and you need work, we will hold your position open. So wow. he'll at least be home for the summer, which my girls, we're trying keeping a secret. And my husband, just future note, if you need to keep a secret, don't tell him. Um, <laughs> He totally slipped on the phone this morning with my middle child and she and uh, we kept talking. I'm thinking maybe she missed it. And she went, wait a minute. When is dad's leaving there? Where is dad going? And then her face lit up. Is dad come home? And she was like, ah. So yeah. So, so the one time a teenager listens. Right. Oh, she's not even a teenager, but she acts like it. She's a uh, 10 year old. But yes, exactly. That my kids don't miss anything. They you can't get anything by those kids. But anyway, so we will have one audience member. If you want to join my husband in the cheering section, you can be there at Dagwas and Blondies at 10 a.m. on Monday the 10th. 
And if you can't be there, then be here online with us. We'd love to have you chat with us live mm -hmm. as usual. Yeah, awesome. But Monday, Monday, not Monday. Thursday next week. Yeah. We'll be tweeting the crap out of that so that everyone sees <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, it's so All weird. Right. It is so weird. All right. Anything else, ladies, before we say goodbye? I don't think not so. That I can think of. All right. Well, this concludes today's episode of the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us and join us next week on Monday, June 10th, where we will be broadcasting live from a special location. But until then, may your pen be prolific, may your deadlines be met, and may all of your words honor Christ. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.